This is Mrs. Palmer Kwai with the second video for Unit 16. In this video, I'm going to talk about pregnancy and a quick overview of human development. It's really just going to cover the topics from Goal 2 in Unit 16. I forgot to change these numbers. The video was getting long enough and I decided to stop. I want to start with just a quick overview of all the stages of human development. Human life, of course, starts with fertilization, and fertilization, when an egg and a sperm cell come together and their two nuclei fuse, then you have a zygote, that first fertilized egg cell, that single cell that gets us all started, is a zygote. In the first eight weeks, it is known as an embryo. That goes from, um, actually there's sort of this time period in between when it's just one cell to when it implants in the uterus. And so there's this, this nebulous time in between. But once implantation has occurred, then we talk about the developing baby as an embryo from implantation to eight weeks. And then it's a fetus from week nine through week 40 at, or birth. The neonatal time period is from birth through the first month. Infancy is from a month to two years. Sometimes you'll see just one year, but basically uh, you have infants and maybe toddlers, that one to two year old type child. From age two up until puberty, you are in your childhood. And of course at puberty you enter adolescence, which ends, uh, well, when you're done growing. It's really hard to put an end date on that. Uh, physically you can, you can sort of target that one a little bit easier, but there's a lot of... Um, mental development, your neurons are reforming new connections, emotional developments happening, happening during adolescence, and so it's really hard to put an end date on that. Adolescence is a time of a stable condition. Really, things are not changing for many, many years. Some degeneration starting to happen in body systems, but pretty much you just sort of are what you are through adulthood. And then senescence is when you reach old age until the point of death, the end of the lifespan. Pregnancy, of course, is determined by the presence of a developing embryo. You can't be a little bit pregnant. You're either pregnant or not pregnant. Pregnancy in humans lasts 40 weeks, so that's uh, not really 9 months. It's getting kind of close to 10 months. And it's divided into three trimesters of three months each. We're not really going to go through the details of each of these trimesters in this video. There's just way too much material to cover. But just realize that if you are pregnant at some point, or if you as a man are married to someone who is pregnant, all of the information is organized around the trimesters. Pregnancy is regulated by hormones, hormones both from the mother and the developing embryo and the placenta, so it's a, a combination of effects here working together. Let's start with fertilization because that's where we need to get going if we're going to trace human development. You need, of course, an oocyte, a mature oocyte from the mother, and mature sperm cells from the father. Ovulation typically occurs about halfway through a menstrual cycle, so roughly 14 days into the cycle. And the oocyte is viable. It's able to be fertilized alive and healthy for about one day after ovulation. Sperm can be viable for up to three days, so there's a little bit more leeway there in how uh, many days they are alive. But there is kind of a small window for um, successful fertilization. So you can see why it can be difficult for some people to um, you know, hit that right moment and get pregnant. We talked in the previous video that there are millions of sperm released with each e ejaculation. But when it comes to fertilization, only a few hundred actually make it to the oocyte. They've got to swim their way in from where they've been deposited in the vagina all the way up to a fallopian tube. And there will be the vaginal secretions and the high acid environment in the vagina. And there are white blood cells or leukocytes there ready to you know, treat the sperm as an invading foreign body. Uh, sperm may swim up the wrong fallopian tube and not come anywhere near the oocyte that was released from the ovary on the other side. But um, eventually a few hundred will, if fertilization is going to occur, they will reach the oocyte. And there, a few hundred are needed. Multiple sperm must all work together if we want to anthropomorphize them. They must all be there to release the enzymes and the acids that are contained in the acrosome, which remember it is on the very um, end of the head of the sperm, because those enzymes and acids are needed to dissolve a glycoprotein layer called the zona pellucida that is around the egg cell for protection. 
And so the, you know, only one sperm is going to get through and fertilize that egg, but multiple sperm are needed to cut a hole for that one sperm. One of the ways that a man is determined to be infertile is by having a low sperm count. He may have functional sperm that look healthy under the microscope, but he doesn't have very many of them. And this particular step in having to have enough sperm reach the egg to cut a hole through the zona pellucida would be the reason that he would be um, designated as infertile, that he doesn't have enough sperm so that the percentages of who will survive all the way to the, um, into the fallopian tube are too low. When that sperm enters the oocyte, it triggers a release of enzymes that harden down the zona pellucida, so there's no chance of another sperm entering, because we just want those 23 chromosomes from the sperm to mix, mix with the 23 chromosomes that are present in the oocyte. There's no need for any more chromosomes. That would be disastrous. So here is an electron microscope picture of an egg cell besieged by many sperm. Of course, they're all there releasing the enzymes to dig their way through that zona pellucida. The, um, this picture over here, this diagram, shows that the oocyte is dividing at the time of fertilization. And they, we didn't go into oogenesis in detail in the previous video, but we talked about how with the, the spermatogenesis, one parent cell makes four sperm cells, and all that division happens so that you get four viable sperm cell out of every parent cell. In oocyte development, you have, as I uh, mentioned, just the nucleus is thrown off, and those are called polar bodies, so that there's a big uh, cytoplasm and organelles collected there to help get that first cell, first for the ozygote on its way. And for whatever reason, the second meiotic division does not happen until the sperm enters the egg. The um, chromosomes are all lined up in metaphase right down the middle of the oocyte, and they are sitting there waiting for that sperm to enter. So here our sperm is penetrating the cell membrane, and it triggers anaphase, it triggers these chromosomes being pulled apart, and one of these bunches is going to turn into a second polar body, which will just be tossed out and allowed to decay, and the other one will be the nucleus then of the oocyte that will um, fuse to the nucleus from the sperm and create the zygote. After the egg has been fertilized, after you have formed that zygote, in about 30 hours, it enters the next stage, which is cleavage or division. The cell of the, the zygote divides for the first time about 30 hours in, and then over the next couple days, continues to divide without getting any bigger, so that the size of the human egg cell remains that same size, but there are more cells making it up, down to at least about 16 cells when we enter the stage, which is known as the marula. Keeping the, um, not having growth occur causes a greater surface area to volume ratio to develop because smaller items have a more, have more surface area per their um, internal volume. And the surface area is important because that's where nutrients are, will pass into the cell so that for any one cell, there is a limit to how big it will get because there has to be enough surface area for enough diffusion to happen across the cell membrane. But the other way, the smaller a cell is, the greater the surface area and compared to its volume. Of course, you have to have enough volume to have the organelles inside. But the way that, that our body has been designed with these zygotes, we can do quite a bit of division without losing the viability of the organelles. And so you have this rapid division over the course of a couple days to form this solid ball of cells called a marula. And then the cells then rearrange themselves to form a hollow ball, which is called a blastocyst. And in that blastocyst, there is an outer layer of cells, also called the tropoblast, and an inner cell mass. And this inner cell mass is what will become the embryo. These are the cells that will become the person. And they are the embryonic stem cells. When you hear about stem cell research and wanting to use embryonic stem cells to uh, perhaps heal other diseases, these are the cells that they're talking about, the ones that are not differentiated yet into an embryo, but they are the ones that will become an embryo. 
So here's just a, a picture to show that. Um, we don't have the egg cell nucleus in metaphase in this particular diagram, but we're showing the two nuclei here fusing together, and then it's dividing to this marula, which is at least 16 cells, but it can be 100. It's just a solid mass of cells. And then, of course, it, it's going to be slightly bigger once it gets to the blastocyst. They've kept all of these about the same size. But as the cells sort of rearrange and push out, we have this empty cavity in the middle with a layer of cells around the outside, the tropoblast, and then this inner cell layer that's going to become the embryo. The next major step that happen is, happens is implantation. Fertilization and cleavage happen in the fallopian tube over a course of several days. Implantation occurs in the uterus, and it occurs about a week, about seven days after fertilization. If fertilization happens on day 14, then, then we're talking about day 21 in the 28-day cycle. So it's before a woman would be anticipating the start of her next period. Um, that's when actual implantation is going to occur. The blastocyst burrows its way into the endometrium, which, if you remember, at this point in the cycle has been um, nourished by progesterone released by the corpus luteum. That is what develops in the ovary after the um, ovulation has occurred, after the egg cell has been released. And so you've got the richly supplied with blood vessels and nutrients uh, functional layer of the endometrium in the uterus, and the blastocyst is basically going to eat its way in by releasing digestive enzymes. It's going to, you know, go underground, actually embed itself right in that lining. By doing that, it, it will break the ends of the, the blood vessels, the capillaries, and form little spaces, which are lacunae. We've seen that before as a general term for spaces, that then become sort of blood-filled cavities that will be surrounding the blastocyst and provide nutrients and removing waste by diffusion across the cell membranes of the many cells in the tropoblast. The tropoblast also secretes human chorionic gon gonadotropin, which is a hormone that helps form the placenta and it keeps the lining present in the uterus. It will um, trigger the corpus luteum to continue to secrete progesterone, which is the hormone that keeps the uterus lining attached. So here's a diagram to go with this. We've got our egg released over here from the ovary. Fertilization occurs in this fallopian tube. This zygote drifts its way down, uh, slowly dividing over the course of several days. We get to our marula, or ball of cells, and then that starts to create sort of a hollow-filled blastocyst that will implant here right in the uterine, li uterine lining, and you can see it goes right underground all the way in. Over here on the right, we have an actual microscope slide of that same setup, so you can see the blastocyst inside the uterine lining. There are many hormones involved in keeping a pregnancy going. I just mentioned human chorionic gonadotropin, HCG. That's the hormone that is tested for in the home pregnancy tests. And it is secreted by the tropoblast cells, and it works first to maintain the corpus luteum to keep the progesterone levels high. The placenta, after it is formed, it takes several weeks to get the placenta organized, but it also then is going to secrete estrogens and progesterone, taking over from what's happening with the corpus luteum. And so first the ovary provides the hormones as triggered by the embryo itself, by the tropoblast cells that are part of that fertilized beginning embryo, and then the placenta takes over that. The estrogens and progesterone are involved in keeping the uterine lining healthy, also keeping FSH and LH from being released so there'll be no, um, in, no triggering of any more ovulation going on. The ovaries are just going to rest. No follicles are going to develop. They inhibit uterine contractions. Normally, the uterine contracts even when you're not in labor. There's just sort of little twitches and such, and so this... Um, is going to be toned down by progesterone and various estrogens, and then just calls enlargement of the breasts as part of the preparation for the coming baby. There are some charts showing 
the these uh, hormones working together. So this first one is showing that we have this big peak of HCG, and then it will go down as the tropoblast um, transfers itself into becoming part of the chorion, and then the placenta. We'll get to that. And then a slow building of estrogens and progesterones. These are coming from the placenta, which you can see over here, this ovarian cycle of um, progesterone is what would be supplied by the corpus luteum as triggered by HCG, and then placental progesterone would be what would be provided for the rest of the pregnancy until you get to the um, point of labor at the end. Other hormones that also are produced during pregnancy include relaxin, which is important for keeping the uterus relaxed, but it also relaxes ligaments, and so Excuse me. The um, there needs to be the pelvic girdle needs to be able to stretch a little bit to allow the baby to be born, and so you want those ligaments to be loose. And um, it the the pubic symphysis is one of the places where the relaxant hormone seeks to cause those that fibrous cartilage in between and the ligaments that are holding those parts of the bone together to just be able to give a little bit. Um, it also sometimes causes then that give to stick around. Some women find that after they've had a baby, their hips are just a little bit wider than before because the, they just don't reset all the way. Relaxin is also involved in increasing the blood flow because you do need to have more blood when you are pregnant in order to maintain the higher metabolism and the waste product and nutrient supply to the baby. Placental lactogen, another placental hormone, is involved in breast development. Um, as already mentioned, metabolism goes up, you need more blood volume, and so aldosterone is at higher levels because we want to have sodium reabsorbed, because where sodium goes, water follows, so to keep the volumes high in the blood. And then parathyroid hormone, of course, keeps calcium levels at the correct levels through this whole process. Some of the other changes that happen in pregnancy, well, as the uterus grows, because the baby's in the way, um, the, the rest of the stuff in the abdominal organs get pushed around. A person changes their center of balance, especially if they carry the baby very far out to the front, and this, the squashing of the other um, abdominal uh, digestive organs may cause heartburn or back or sciatic nerve pain. Since more oxygen is needed to go along with this increase in metabolism, there are increases in blood volume and an increase in cardiac output. That's heart rate, an increase in breathing rate, an increase in urine production, which I'm sure you've at least heard anecdotally about having to go to the bathroom all the time when someone's pregnant. There is some increase in nutrients needed, but it's really just through the last trimester when the baby is undergoing a great deal of increase in weight and growth. Um, it is not necessary to eat for two from the very beginning of pregnancy. And then the increase in hormones can have other unusual side effects. Uh, for me personally, my vision changed substantially when I was pregnant with my daughter. It did not change substantially when I was pregnant with any of my three sons. So her, the hormones that she was adding into the mix evidently had a change on my eyes that I did not experience later, and that's something that my eye doctor told me was fairly common with pregnancy. So there's other weird side effects that nobody ever talks about that go along with pregnancy as well. This diagram just shows you visually what happens to the abdominal organs, the digestive organs, as this baby grows and takes up space. Here on the left, you can see we've got this tiny little uterus, not very large at all, and there's lots of room for the intestines and um, the bladder. And then here, we're, we're very much close to the end of pregnancy, and so the um, you, know, the, you can see the bladder is well squashed down here, and the intestinal system is kind of squashed up here, and no wonder somebody is experiencing discomfort. You can also see that there's a greater curvature to the spine, lordosis, that occurs with this added weight in the front, and that can contribute to back pain. There's a whole list of other changes that are listed over here that I'm not going to go through, but you can just read through them yourself. Moving on to embryonic development, this is the stage up to eight weeks. And during this time period, this is a critical time period in the development of a human. The placenta itself will develop, all the major internal organs will form, and all the major external body features will appear so that you end up at the end of eight weeks with something that is recognizably human. 
I'm not going to go through all of the details for embryonic development. They are very, very complicated, but I just want to mention a few important things. There is a stage called gastrulation that happens after the blastocyst has added a great deal of cells to it as it's developing. And the inner cell mass undergoes a massive reorganization of the cells so that it forms three distinct layers, germ layers, that will later give rise to the various body organs. And so here we have a blastocyst showing in the diagram. This is a little bit later on in the, um, it's at 18 days from fertilization. And so you have the... Um, what had become, what it started as the inner cell mass now has become the gastrula, and it has, has uh, sort of rounded up and um, it's a flattened disc, but it's a three-dimensional flattened disc. And you can see over on, this, on the right that we have the ectoderm as one layer here on the top in blue, and the mesoderm in red in the middle, and the endoderm on the bottom. And then we have a yolk sac underneath that is full, filled with various nutrients very much involved the yolk sac is in, in making blood cells initially. And we have the beginnings of the amniotic cavity, the amniotic sac here that will be going around the embryo very um, shortly. And so those germ layers that develop during gastrulation are the beginnings of the di differentiation of cells into all of the body systems. This shows you where they go. So the ectoderm, which is the one here that's on the top towards the amniotic fluid side, that becomes your skin and your central nervous system and various pigment cells that give color to your hair and your body. The mesoderm becomes your muscles and your red blood cells and the um, various cells in certain cells inside your organs. And then the endoderm becomes most of your internal organs. And so your body then is able to differentiate these cells that when they were in the inner cell mass, they were undifferentiated. They could be anything. But when they have been divided into these layers, then they start to differentiate and become specific cells that are going to become particular organs. So of course the control of this development and differentiation of cells into various tissues will be regulated by genes. And the genes that control this section are known as Hox genes, and they are involved in turning on other genes or turning off other genes to control development of certain segments of the body. Almost all of our human cells have a cilia, and it's known as a primary cilium. It's one. It's not one that built that beats. I'm sorry. It's not one that moves, but it is a non-motile. It is a stationary cilia that almost serves like an antenna for the chemical signals that are coming from these genes. As they are turned on and turned off, they're producing proteins, and proteins, of course, are chemicals, and they are being messages to other cells. Recent research is suggesting that defection, defective cilia, or you know. Uh, partially functioning cilia are what are involved in many diseases. Polycystic kidney disease is one that's been very specifically identified as caused by a defective primary cilium, but it certainly hints that other diseases and disorders may also be because the antenna to get the messages from some other gene did not pick up the messages that it needed to during this cell's development. And that leads to problems sometimes right away or sometimes many years into lifespan. As the body is shaped and develops through the embryonic period, both cell growth increasing in cells in number and size and cell death apoptosis is used to shape the body. So for example, your hands come start off in a very webbed form and the cells that were in between the fingers, they will die allowing those fingers to be free. We really are only beginning to understand this very complicated process of development. Um, just a few hints of how these things work. And as I said, you know, I, I can only just touch on a few things in this um, video because it is just very, very complex. It's a whole course of its own. This slide shows the various stages of embryonic development. The Carnegie stages is a system of identifying how mature an embryo is, and so the numbers are uh, not related to the actual weeks or days. You'd have to look below to see. Here we've got our eight-week-old um, 
fetus or embryo at 56 days, and it's a Carnegie stage 23. So you can just see how the various body parts develop. Some things are very clear. You can see this heart here in the middle of this particular embryo very easily. You can see, you know, eyes coming up uh, very clearly from about stage 18 on. And so as I said, by the time we get down here to eight weeks, the embryo is discernibly human and has all of the major external features and all of those internal organs have been formed. There are four membranes that are involved in the developing embryo. I've already mentioned the yolk sac in the previous slide, and the yolk sac is involved in forming blood cells in the early stages of development and eventually will contribute to the sex cells. The allantois is another membrane that is involved in getting those early blood cells starting, and it gives rise to the umbilical arteries and vein, and eventually goes on to form part of the bladder. The other two membranes stick around for the entire pregnancy and are much more important overall, the chorion and the amnion, so I'm going to be talking about those with individual slides. So this diagram lets you see these various membranes, and we'll just start with the large one here, so that the um, amnion or the amnionic sac is all the way around the embryo here. You can see what's left of the yolk sac in yellow just like an egg yolk. The allantois is not visible um, on this large one. We do see have it have it indicated over here as part of the umbilical cord as it is forming. And then the chorion um, you can see labeled here the villi, we'll get to those, are what really are attaching into the um, maternal uterine wall. But the chorion then becomes this larger membrane around the embryo. And eventually as the embryo grows, the amnion and the chorion, at least on this side, away from the attachment to the uterine wall, they will fuse. So at the end point they are together. So the placenta. When the tropoblast burrows its way into the endometrium, you have a second layer of cells forming. The tropoblast is one layer of cells and a second layer form, and they develop into chorionic villi, which are just like the villi that we've seen in the intestinal system, except they tend to be a little more branched. And so you've got folds of cell membrane that are going into that nutrient blood vessel rich endometrium lining. Um, inside this villia, villi, as the um, embryo develops, you have arteries and veins so that the, as materials diffuse across the membrane, then they can be picked up by the blood system of the developing embryo. The placental membrane surrounds each of the edges of this villi, of, of any individual villi, so you've got a membrane around all of these so that the blood that's out here around the outside of the villi, which is coming from the maternal side, is not mixing directly with the embryonic blood. There is you know, a membrane in the way, so the substances are exchanged across this membrane. Initially, the chorionic membrane is all the way around the blastocyst because, as I showed you earlier, it burrows all the way down and buries itself in the uterine um, endometrium. But there will come a point of time when the embryonic system is too big, and so the, the chorion is going to push out from the endometrium and only end up connecting on one side through the placenta itself. And so it's no longer connected on the far side, as I showed in the previous picture. Here's a picture of a, a full-term baby, pretty much. And so we have our placenta here. This is where the connection has stayed. The placenta has grown and developed as the embryo has. So when the um, chorion blast, the chorion then breaks its way through the endometrium, there are enough connections left on the near side that um, the attachment is good. The, here, there are some drawings here of the placenta, what it looks like from the baby side, coming down the umbilical cord and into the various arteries and veins on this side of the placenta. And then this is the other side. This is where it is attaching into the um, uterine lining. And so down below, I've got some actual pictures of real placenta. Not very appetizing, I know, but a very, very important 
structure that is built by the embryo so that nutrients from the mother can be brought into the embryonic system and supply everything it needs to grow. The amnion is that other key membrane, and this one starts off surrounding the embryo, and it is uh, shows up at about the second week of development. It is filled with a fluid known as amniotic fluid, and this provides a waterbed for the embryo, a warm waterbed that is um, provides for freedom of movement and lubrication of various body parts as they develop, and some protection against jarring or bouncing around if the mother happens to, you know, move quickly. The amniotic fluid is cleansed by the maternal system, so it's not stationary. It doesn't, you know, it's not unchanged in there. And as the baby grows, um, during about the fourth month and, and following, the fetus will actually practice swallowing and challenge its digestive system by taking in some amniotic fluid regularly and then urinating it out. So that, of course, this is all going to be cleansed by the maternal system, but the digestive system is functioning, is kind of practicing its way as the baby swallows the amniotic fluid, which is mostly water with a few ions, um, and passes it through. Teratogens are substances that interfere with development and cause birth defects. These are things that are not part of a genetic makeup, but they're from the outside. The embryonic stage of development, those first eight weeks, is the most critical period of time for the whole development of the whole individual because everything is being put together at that point. There are other body parts and organs that have their own specific critical periods that, that may be more or less than that first eight weeks. Um, and various chemicals or drugs, both prescribed and over-the-counter, or infectious agents like viruses or radiation from x-rays or other medical text, tests can all cause birth defects and where the uh, in the development of the individual the teratogen occurs will determine what sort of birth defects happen. This chart just gives you an idea of where some of those critical time periods are. So your darker purple ones are a more critical time period and the lighter purple is yes it's still going to have some effect but not quite so drastic. Um, so, of course, your central nervous system, your brain, is developing the entire time that of gestation. And so any um, teratogen can have an effect, you know, it can have an effect during any part of that time period. But the heart or the arm, for example, is, is done being developed at this point. So anything that would happen later on, say, you know, to at week 12 or something, may not affect those particular organs because they have finished their developing. Some of the common things that are causing birth defects um, in the past or still present, thalidomide is a, was used as a tranquilizer in right around 1960, the late 50s and early 60s, primarily in Europe, and unfortunately, it caused a severe birth defect where children were born without any arms or legs. They had little flipper-like um, hands and feet attached to the torso. And so um, I know this is a little, probably a little bit old for you. This is, I knew people um, about my same age. I'm, I'm at the bottom end of that scale, but had experienced this. I've, I've met them in my lifespan, but um, this drug is still used for certain disorders today. It's a treatment for leprosy and a couple other things, and so uh, it's one of those conditions that, you know, it's going to say very strongly on the packaging. If you are pregnant or suspect you may be pregnant, do not take thalidomide because it is a, a definite teratogen. German measles, a virus, is also another cause of birth defects. It's not so much of an issue anymore because of vaccination, but exposure in the first trimester leads to deafness and cataracts of the eye and heart defects. And my mother's cousin um, experienced this. His mother was pregnant, uh, got pregnant at her honeymoon, didn't realize it, and experienced German measles or rubella um, shortly after that time. And so her first child was born um, profoundly deaf. Much more common are the effects of alcohol. Alcohol causes something called fetal alcohol syndrome. There is a characteristic appearance to children suffering from this, and the results are somewhere between mild learning disabilities to severe developmental delays depending upon when the alcohol was experienced and the level of alcohol consumption. Alcohol is a poison. Our bodies probably can tolerate it just fine in very small amounts, 
But um, certainly when you're pregnant, it's something that you want to be extremely careful about. The other thing that has a big impact on developing babies in our country is cigarettes. This uh, is not so much a direct birth defect, but because the cigarette smoke contains carbon monoxide and that binds to hemoglobin, it creates a low oxygen situation for the baby. It creates it for the person smoking as well, but they aren't undergoing drastic growth like an embryo or fetus is. And so overall, cigarettes cause poor prenatal growth, prematurity, low birth weight, you know, undersized um, baby. There are numerous other chemicals that are part of industry or drugs that, that as I mentioned, can be over-the-counter or prescribed by your doctor or other viruses. Chickenpox is another one um, that may call it, cause a miscarriage or physical deformities, mental impairment, or poor prenatal growth. So there are a number of things, and the reason that, that women are told when they're pregnant to avoid all of this stuff is because there is a definite connection between these certain substances and the health of their developing child. The fetal stage of development goes from eight weeks until birth. And during this time period, these body systems that were started in the first eight weeks are developed and matured. And you see a great change in body proportions. Uh, the head proportionally becomes smaller compared to the entire body, but it still is fairly large, uh, especially compared to the adult human. I'm not going to go over any real specifics on these, the fetal stage um, because Really, it's just steps as the body systems are maturing. The birth process is the next major thing that happens. And as the placenta ages, it's not quite so good at producing progesterone any, no, any longer. And progesterone is, you know, keeps the uterus calm and um, the, the lining well-developed. And so as the placenta ages, these things start to break down. The cervix typically will thin and begin to open up towards the end of pregnancy. Oxytocin, which is a hormone that encourages uterine contractions, its, predict its production is triggered by the stretching of the uterus as the baby gets larger. It also is very much involved in active labor itself. We think right now that the surfactants that are produced by babies are what really trigger the actual start of labor. And so there's this conversation between the developing fetus and the mother's body that the fetus is basically saying by producing this surfactant that it is ready to breathe air. And so now it is time to be born. This is a fairly recent discovery within the past 10 years, and we're still really kind of understanding the mechanism. But... Um, there's, you know, we're not quite sure what exactly the starting point was for labor, what sort of factors all got together. And one certainly seems to be that the surfactant production by the baby is, saying, is signaling that the lungs are now ready for air. We talked in the very beginning of the course how childbirth is a positive feedback loop, one of the few ones that are present in the body. So when the baby's head is pushed down on the cervix by contraction, it drives a, to a stronger contraction. Labor itself is divided into three stages, and for the first time, mother to labor averages about 20 hours. It um, averages about eight for someone who's already had a child. The first stage involves the dilation of the cervix. It has to go from being a closed opening, the door is shut during most of um, a, a woman's life, and certainly during most of pregnancy. It needs to open up to about 10 centimeters, about large enough to allow a grapefruit to pass through because that's about the size of a baby's head. The second stage involves the crowning of the head, seeing the head um, from looking from the outside. You can see the top of the head and moving down the birth canal to delivery. This stage is typically much faster than the first stage. The dilation of the cervix is the stage that takes forever. And then the delivery of the baby is when, you know, women are pushing um, and they show it in various ways on television. I find that most of the sitcom uh, depictions of labor are pretty ridiculous, but if you have ever seen the PBS show Call the Midwife, those are a little more true to life. And then the third stage of labor is the delivery of the placenta. Uh, typically now the doctor will give a shot of oxytocin to encourage the placenta to detach from the uterine wall. In the good old days or where there's not oxytocin available, uh, this is, can be another half an hour after the baby is born, waiting for the body itself to go through the detaching process. 
Here's some pictures that depict this. So in our first stage of labor, the cervix relaxes and dilates. Um, this is when you know the, the pushing of the baby's head with the contraction then will trigger that cervix to continue to spread apart. In the second stage, the head then and the rest of the body passes through the birth canal, and typically babies are born looking at the floor. This allows the soft parts of their face here to be pushing up against the hard bones of the spine, but it's not impossible for children to be born facing sunny side up, um, and generally without significant complications, my children decided to arrive that way. And then in the third stage, the placenta is expelled. During the postnatal period after birth, the mother's body slowly returns to pre-pregnant metabolism, but she's probably going to be stuck with stretch marks and possibly some other um, hemorrhoids or a slightly larger hip uh, just because there are some things that don't ever go away after you've had a baby. The baby enters the neonatal period, and this is when it takes on the responsibilities of respiration and getting nutrients and digesting them and excreting race wastes and regulating body temperature and having their blood volume and heart rate uh, controlled. And there are some, it takes a while for this to happen with neonatal, um, with infants, this small thermoregulation especially. Um, can be difficult for several weeks. It just takes a while for those body systems to work. And the immune system does not really kick in for about two weeks, which is why breast milk, which is full of antibodies provided as a passive immunity for the babies, is such a good thing because their immune system is not quite ready to take on fighting off all those pathogens. And so the, best, the breast milk, the colostrum, the first milk, contains antibodies for the baby. It's also a good reason why it's it, to take keep a child, a yeah, very young child, at home for a couple of weeks. Um, don't bring them to church three days after they're born, even if you're out of the hospital. Give them a, give their body a chance to develop some of these systems. The next major developmental period is infancy, which goes from the end of the fourth week after the neonatal period to about two years. During this time period, there's a great deal of growth going on. Typically, children will triple their birth weight in the first year. Also, you get to have those primary teeth come out, usually with very fussy children, and muscular and nervous systems mature. And they mature from the top down, and so babies are able to control their eyes before they're able to control their feet. They can do things with their fingers before they can walk. Um, you know, We just see a progress from the head to the toe in maturation. There's also communication and interaction with caregivers and family members during this first year. It might not be verbal, but you definitely get responsiveness from an infant. Childhood covers time from infancy to puberty. Again, the growth rate is, growth rate is still high. There's a lot of growing that happens between the time you're 2 and you're 10 or 12. Permanent teeth will come in and replace those baby teeth greater muscular control, you know, bladder and bowel control, and of course intellectual ma abilities mature as the brain develops. Adolescence, of course, is that time when puberty kicks in and changes everything. Secondary sex characteristics develop, um, the brain reorganizes, the person, you know, experiences emotional ups and downs as they're dealing with hormones and trying to figure out their own personal identity. Final growth Spurts appear generally around puberty, uh, earlier for girls than for boys in general. And just overall, the people get better at doing fine motor skills and handling more abstract thought and in their intellectual skill during this period. Then we hit adulthood, which is from after adolescence ends when kind of growing is done. And I said that's really very vague, um, to a point of old age, which is also very vague. And at this, during adulthood, a person remains relatively unchanged. It's a very stable time, um, both physically and physiologically. There are some degenerative changes that start, and as you get older, they you know, become more obvious. But in general, you're functioning just fine, and you're the same as you were a month ago or a year ago. Senescence is the time of old age to death. And during this time period, which again is very vague so far as age, but I would think that probably by the time you're, if you are 80, you are in senescence, um, degenerative changes continue, 
Overall, the body just becomes less able to cope with the demands of life. And we've mentioned this as we've talked about individual organ systems. And then death comes from various reasons. There's, there are many things that can cause the body to just shut down completely. Scientists think that the human lifespan at this point is approximately 120 years, but our life expectancy, what you can expect to live, is about 75 years for men and 83 years for women. Individuals, of course, can either not make that or well exceed it, but that's the average. And our understandings of medicine and supportive services are what really are uh, contributing to our improved life expectancy. So that's what I wanted to cover for this video. This finishes the videos for Unit 16.